Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. In my last video I reported the latest archaeological updates regarding the ancient pre-pottery Neolithic site of Gebekli Tepe, which was presented by Dr Lee Clare who featured on the Archaeology Harbour YouTube channel two weeks ago. On the same livestream, archaeologist Professor Nesmi Carroll gave an update on the work that's been taking place at the sister site Karahan Tepe, and I spent last week doing my best to transcribe and translate his words into English, so I can present the latest information to the viewers of the Ancient Architects channel, and there is a lot to say. Google translating an auto-generated transcript in Turkish is no easy feat but I did my best and Professor Carroll does give a fantastic overview of the site, as well as his own thoughts and initial interpretations. Unless you can speak Turkish, you won't find this information anywhere else online, being the most up-to-date overview of this truly breathtaking site. First of all, the archaeology and the natural landscape at this location is incredibly well preserved and this is helping us to get an accurate and relatively undisturbed view of this very very ancient site. Karahan Tepe consists of four separate areas. The quarries for the T-shaped pillars are located here to the southwest. On the eastern terrace, which remains unexcavated, there are pillars poking through the ground surface and aerial photos and geomagnetic surveys show there are many communal special structures and also residential buildings buried beneath the surface. This area is known as the Southern Plain and on field walking this area, no pillars are seen poking through the surface implying it is unlikely that any structures below ground had a communal function, as the communal special buildings generally have the T-shaped pillars. Therefore it is likely that this area did have a specific function, maybe a purely residential area or maybe workshops I don't know. The fourth area is the western slope and this is where the excavations have been taking place in recent years and you'll have seen these incredible ancient ruins in the media and also on this channel where we find both communal special purpose buildings with T-shaped pillars and also smaller residential structures, both cut into the bedrock and made from stone. These approximately date between 9400 and 8200 BC, but admittedly this is from a limited carbon-14 dataset. The dates are of course significant though. This was a period of transition in southeastern Anatolia, when communities evolved a sedentary lifestyle, so understanding the archaeology at Karahan Tepe is important. We need to be able to define what we are finding, how the special communal structures were used, the layout of the site, the relationships between structures and also how it functioned. We need to learn about how the people lived and how the community functioned as a whole. There is clearly organisation at this site. Although communal structures like this large enclosure known as AD were likely places where people gathered on occasion, Karahan Tepe was certainly a place where people were living a settled lifestyle. The same can now be said for Gebekli Tepe as well, as shown in my last video. Interestingly, although these enclosures have been excavated and publicised, what many don't know is that there are many more communal structures just waiting to be excavated. We know this from aerial photography and geophysics, and for all we know, each structure may have had a different function within the settlement. Just look at how much of the site has been excavated so far, a very small portion so the archaeology within this area will no doubt be studied for decades to come. Karahan Tepe is enormous, spread over this huge area, 3 to 400 metres north to south and east to west, and it was an established settlement, in use for maybe 1,500 years. Think about that, that is an incredibly long period of time. 
We can excavate a site, but we are only seeing it in its final phase of occupation. Piecing the history together is another story. When people say that places like Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe came from nowhere, they really don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea of the development of the site, and they are not looking at the wider landscape. Southeastern Anatolia has dozens of megalithic sites, and some of them do have origins from before the Younger Dryas, and I would urge you to do your research before making any conclusions. During the lifespan of the settlement, the people that lived in Karahan Tepe underwent many societal, architectural and technological transformations. The site evolved as people evolved. The site grew as the population grew. It didn't just appear like this overnight. And during the period of occupation at Karahan Tepe, we know there was an enormous transition in progress, from hunting and gathering to agriculture and domestication. It was an extremely important period in the human story, arguably the most important. We still have so much to learn about what happened at this time, how and why the change in lifestyle did emerge, and, in time, Karahan Tepe could well be the site to provide the answers. Work is being done to understand the use of resources at the site, the water collection, hunting grounds, societal organisation, the structure of the settlement, and also the land surrounding. The bigger picture is just as important as the detail. Nobody can draw any conclusions based on the limited excavation so far. So, in terms of resources, the quarries for the stone pillars are on site, as shown on the diagram. They're located to the southwest. Each pillar was quarried in one piece, and we can see an unfinished pillar still in situ today, and it measures around 6 metres in length. Because of the abundance of natural rock outcrops at Karahan Tepe, it is possible the natural geology and geography, the availability of stone, may have dictated why people settled at this location. I.e., Karahan Tepe is located here because of the rock exposures. Having resources close by made the job of building a settlement far easier. Now to the main enclosures excavated so far, and these are known as enclosures AA, AB and AD, clearly an important complex at the site. And because of the lack of domestic archaeology, they were likely built for a communal function, purpose-built enclosures for public use, but there are also private structures attached. As we can see by looking at pictures, the complex has a number of different structural features, different architectural styles, different associated artefacts and so on. Preliminary studies of the large enclosure AD show that it does look like it was filled in by hand, and not by nature, meaning it was decommissioned artificially, by humans, and that's because the rubble infill slopes in more than one direction. It doesn't just follow the natural slope of the land. So, Professor Carroll does believe it was consciously buried after going out of use. In comparison, the infill of the oval enclosures of Gebekli Tepe do slope in the same direction as the land, implying that natural slope slides may have been the primary cause of infilling. Of course, a landslide could have destroyed and partly infilled enclosure AD at Karahan Tepe. The people would have then had the choice to clear it out, repair it and renovate it, or decommission it altogether. It all depends on the damage. If the latter, then the inhabitants of Karahan Tepe could have merely finished the job that nature started, levelling the ground surface by filling in the enclosure. Just like Enclosure C at Gebekli Tepe, Enclosure AD at Karahan Tepe also had a number of rebuilding and renovation phases during its life, with the boundary wall progressively moving inwards. Older pillars from earlier phases were also reused. Some of them, whether from an older incarnation of the structure itself, or maybe from another nearby enclosure, were turned horizontally and used for seating or steps in the rebuilding phase. 
the two large central pillars that have shallow footings had also fallen, and they are still in the same place where they fell thousands of years ago. Carroll and many experts agree that these pillars did support a large roof, and it is also now believed that each oval enclosure at Gebekli Tepe also had a roof. Moving on to the decoration of the pillars, and although various animals are seen, the one most frequently depicted at Karahan Tepe is the leopard, which could well be the significant emblem of the site. They are often found on the front faces of pillars. On this bench marked here, made from an old pillar, turned horizontally and reused in a later phase of work, a number of stone plates and statues were found, indicating that this could be some kind of offering area. On the upper step in this section, there are two short pillars and another that's broken. It may have stood upright in the middle, or could have been laid across the two that remain upright. It could be a specific seat, maybe some kind of primitive throne, or maybe it was some kind of altar. On the right hand edge of the bench, this statue of a seated man carrying a leopard on his back was discovered. Directly opposite, and this seems to be another important area of the enclosure. This area was cleaned up by archaeologists this year, and a large number of vulture and fox reliefs were found on the stones. It is flanked by two pillars with a low bench between the two. This head with animal paws on its head, possibly part of a larger statue like this one, was found in this niche marked here. Marked in blue are two pits that are dug into the bedrock, and maybe these were for water or for some unknown fixture and fitting. There are two further pits on the opposite side, and they are different in form, and these could be burial pits, as a human bone was found in one. We next move to the pillared enclosure AB, and Professor Carroll notes the portal between the two enclosures, which has crude steps just below it, going down to the pillared enclosure. Here we can see the various phases of the recent excavations. Carroll believes that this enclosure was also deliberately filled in after going out of use. During the excavations, the bottom of the enclosure was found to have been covered by a layer of red soil. On top of this was then a layer of rubble with mixed archaeological material. Smaller stones were then placed on the tops of pillars, and these supported large flat cover stones. In the past I've argued that these large flat stones were actually the original floor, supported by pillars, and what we actually have is a heated room, and what I think could be a primitive hypercore system. I should add that Professor Carroll does not agree, and that this is my own hypothesis. The face on the rim has sharp human features, it does look masculine, and has hollow deep set eyes and thick lips. It also looks like it once had a beard. Apparently there is an undulating area that goes along the wall, and even extends over the entrance to the large enclosure. I don't quite see it myself, but apparently, we could be looking at a human head with a snake body. There are also more crude steps at the other end of enclosure AB, and the fact we find two sets of steps leads Carol to believe that one is an entrance and one is an exit. Looking from the top, and we can see this snake-like channel opposite the entrance coming in from the outside. According to Carol, if you pour water into this channel, it flows into the pillared enclosure and fills it up. When full, the water can then flow into large enclosure AD through this hole, maybe filling up the cavity in the floor. The channel certainly implies that water was associated with the pillared enclosure, and we can see that enclosures AB and AD did have a specific relationship to one another. Carol believes it may have had a ritualistic purpose related to water, maybe where an ancient initiation ceremony took place. Maybe you entered enclosure AB down one staircase, passed through the pillared enclosure that was filled with water, and then out the other side into the large enclosure, or vice versa. 
You could say it was like a rite of passage or something akin to a Christian baptism. Of course, more work needs to be done and at this stage we can only speculate with the data we have. But yes, the interpretation is fair. We also have to consider the adjacent structure known as AA which has a snake and fox carved onto the bench and there is also a deep pit inside. The three enclosures are clearly interconnected and are part of one complex. Surrounding these three main enclosures, we see small oval or rounded square shaped buildings, each having domestic archaeological finds inside, including large stone vessels or vats. Again, more work needs to be done to understand their use and also their relationship with the main enclosures of the site. Some of these structures contain one or two stone pillars, which were once thought to be only associated with special communal structures. But these were possibly dwellings, and it shows that pillars likely had a functional purpose first and foremost. Their roof supports, and maybe the decoration came after. I think the same can be said for Gebekli Tepe. I'm not sure you can see it too well on this picture, but this monolith has holes drilled into it. Clearly functional, but what that function was we don't know. Maybe people worked inside these small buildings, providing water, food and service to whatever events were taking place inside the communal structures. Maybe they were the homes of people that had specific duties at the complex. Maybe this whole area was a complex for public gatherings and the people that resided in these smaller structures aided the leaders of the settlement. Or maybe they were the leaders themselves. These rectangular or rounded square buildings marked here I believe are from a later phase of building than those we've looked at already. This structure was excavated in 2021. Inside it has benches around the wall and the floor is covered by large flat stones carefully fitted together. There are four symmetrically placed pillars inside. In one corner we find a large stone slab above a window or drainage channel and stone plates were found on the slab in front of it, similar to what we see in enclosure AD. In another corner there's a human head statue positioned in the wall and this was found to be beneath a large stone container. The stone head looks to be from a larger older statue. The enclosure was deliberately destroyed before the beginning of the next phase of work which I think is this more rectangular building next door. The pillars inside are well decorated and also anthropomorphic just like we see with the central pillars of Enclosure D at Gebekli Tepe. You can see the arm running down the side, but the shoulder almost looks like the head of a bird. This is apparently clearer on the other side, and Carol says it looks like the head of a vulture. I do have this picture that was taken by Dakota Wint. The hands meet at the navel on the narrow edge of the pillar, but there are too many fingers and maybe they did double up as bird feathers. I don't know. There is also a triangular or chevron shape, like a collar or necklace, and we see this on various pillars at sites across Tashtapela. Now, if we look at the rectangular building next door, and the floor is made up of numerous flat stones fitted together. Like the previous structure, the corners clearly had specific functions as they are built up. There are pillars inside and there is also mud brick rubble and the experts think that this mud brick could be the remains of the roof that covered it. This may also be an entrance stone. It would have been positioned in the roof but it has since fallen inside and broken. We also find these stones at Gebekli Tepe. Next Professor Carroll runs through the major finds over the past few years. There is this, another statue of a person with a leopard on their back, 70 centimeters tall and currently on display in Shanlerfa Museum. There is this amazing statue of a human head with many realistic facial features and also earrings in the ears. It is very carefully made. 
Because of the way the back of the head protrudes out, it is possible it's actually showing a person wearing a mask. Here we see a sculpture with two heads having a clear dualistic function, maybe young and old or male and female. The faces are realistic and we even see that the hair is braided. Here is part of a discarded broken statue. We can see the arms down the sides, the ribs are highlighted and there is a spider on the chest area. On the torso above where the hands would meet are two foxes facing each other. Here we can see a sitting human statue with the arms and hands in the normal pose. Again the ribs are visible and there is a possible spider on the front. Here we can see a selection of animal heads that were found, including birds and foxes. Here we can see a leopard. This is a wonderful example of a decorated stone vessel and also a fragment. And here we can see more domestic objects. Many human head statues have been found and there are these unusual composite statues. Interestingly, the noses of many statues have been broken off, and it does remind me of the statues of ancient Egypt, where the noses of statues of dead pharaohs have been smashed off, and apparently this was to kill the spirit that lived inside. Maybe there was a similar belief at Karahan Tepe, and the broken noses could give us insight into ancient beliefs. Here we see another statue in a seated position, and it does have a very specific facial expression. These statues really stand out because their heads are looking up to the heavens very specifically. The arms have the usual pose, the ribs are highlighted, and we can see a snake on the front of each statue in relief, and it looks to be heading up the body. This is a well made statue with great detail and it was found embedded in a wall. Here we have some tiny vessels, some made of stone and apparently some of terracotta. One of the highlights was this discovery of a tiny frog figurine, measuring only 2cm across and it is very well made and very realistic. As well as figurines we also find tools and domestic implements, including grinding stones and stone axes. There is this pedestal like find that's made of limestone, and as we can see it is neatly embellished. What its function was we don't know, but something may have been placed on top. I think that this is a shaft straightener, and we can see that this motif has been incised into it which I know in my own research connects Karahan Tepe to Kortik Tepe, a site located in the east in the Tigris Basin. The origins of Kortik Tepe are also older. This symbol has been called the Birdman motif, and now we see it on vessels at Kortik Tepe and also in Karahan Tepe. A number of well-made fine beads have also been discovered, with two examples shown here, and clearly some delicate work. The auto translate function on YouTube is not the best, so I've downloaded the transcript and worked through it manually. To do this I did have to rely on technology, and although I do believe this has been accurate, if you do see an error I am happy to be corrected, so please do comment below. Regular updates from archaeologists regarding these Tashtapela sites are so helpful and important, and I do have to thank the Archaeology Harbour YouTube channel for organising them and making them available to the public. I do hope that this video has given you a good insight into the latest knowledge regarding Karahan Tepe, a fascinating and truly ancient site in Turkey, and I do have a lot more to come. Karahan Tepe is quickly becoming one of my favourite ancient sites, a true wonder of the ancient world, and even with the fantastic archaeology that's already taken place, it's amazing to think that we've only just scratched the surface. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.